Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our author presentation this evening with Patty Kim here at the Laurel Branch. Uh, my name is Marcy, and I'm here to give you a little bit of an introduction about Patty. Patty was born in Busan, South Korea, and she immigrated to the United States with her family in 1974 when she was four years old. Her overall experiences as a young Korean American immigrant have influenced her work. Patty's novels invoke themes of poverty, losing a parent, culture and fitting in, adjusting to a step parent, empathy, and the search for identity. She uses honesty and humor to tell these complex stories. As she grew up, Patty's love for writing and gift for observation led her to study creative writing. She graduated from the University of Maryland with a BA in English in 1992 and an MFA in 1995. High that she began to work on what would end up being her first novel, A Cab Called Reliable. She went on to create her first picture book, Here I Am, as well as the middle grade scan that all began with I'm Ock and continues with It's Girls Like You, Mickey. She is also the 2020 APALA Award Honor Book for I'm Ock. Thank you, and help me welcome Patty Kim. Thanks, Patty. I, my mother tells me, according to my mother, I would show off big time to all the neighborhood kids that I'm going to America. And my parents, my mom, bought me and my sister matching outfits for the day of you know, leaving the country. And I remember the outfit. Uh, it was um, forest green polyester, because it was in the 70s, with these accordion pleat winged sleeves that you can, you can flap, matching accordion pleat uh, bell bottoms, okay? And then she matched us that outfit with a aubergine trench coat and shiny red patent leather Mary Jane shoes. So we were strutting into the airport decked uh, to go to America. Um, super excited. I didn't know why everybody was so sad. Everybody else, Grandmothers, grandfather, uh, everybody else was crying, aunts and uncles, cousins. I was like, why is everybody crying? We're going to America. With that excitement, I rode, we traveled across the ocean. Now, I want you guys to think about how many hours that takes to cross the ocean. It's like, six, it's like 16 hours. We did a stop in Hawaii, okay? And that's for a four-year-old sitting in one place for that long. It's, it's not fun. So that was my first flight ever in my life for that long. And I was still super excited about wanting to be all American. And when they served our meal on the airplane, which was breakfast, it included I don't know, scrambled eggs and sort of this American breakfast, traditional bre conventional breakfast. And I woofed that down no matter how it tasted. My sister, who was older, was a little wiser, and she said, ah, I don't like it. She wasn't used to the way everything tasted. So I said, well, give it to me. I'll eat it for you. So I woofed her breakfast down, too. Then I got super sick, and I threw up. And I remember this, even as a four-year-old, that the woman sitting next to me was an American woman, and I was trying so hard to be well behaved and I threw up all over her. And she happened to have, luckily, her lap was covered with her coat 
So, she, so I remember the, the uh, flight attendant taking the coat with my vomit on it and getting, and then I fell asleep. And I don't, I don't remember what happened after that. But that was my beginning of my journey to America. Fast forward. Now, I should tell you, we first moved into um, a basement. So we lived in a basement in Baltimore, Maryland. And that was temporary. And then once my, my dad found a job, we then moved to Arlington, Virginia, briefly. And then from there, we moved to Riverdale, Maryland. Riverdale. Do we all know Riverdale? Now it's a Riverdale Park. It's kind of fancy, but it wasn't fancy back then. So Riverdale, Maryland was our, I have the fondest childhood memories of growing up there because it was in an apartment complex, Parkview Gardens. We all know Parkview Gardens, right? And there were immigrant families, there Korean family who lived beneath us. Another one lived like up, up the hill. There was a Mexican family, there was a Nigerian family, and we all just played together. Like after school, we're out playing together, in the creek together, in the creek playing together. And that was sort of my fondest memories of growing up, uh, childhood. It was just playtime with everybody together. Well, my parents decided that they wanted us to um, culture shock for me and my sister. Um, because first of all, we were no longer, and it was a single family house with a yard, and nobody was playing outside. So I was in fifth grade now, and nobody was outside playing, so we didn't even know what to play. And it was the first time I was very self-conscious. I think I developed, I think it was age and environment where I developed sort of a self-consciousness about what kind of jeans I needed to wear to school. And Jordash, they were the jeans I needed to get. And I distinctly remember wearing this poncho that my mom bought for me. It was from Salvation Army. It was a gorgeous poncho. And I wore it to school you know, in that county. And I was teased for wearing this poncho. Um, so that was middle, uh, end of elementary school, junior high school, and then um, high school. So I graduated from Winston Churchill. Now this picture is of me um, 12, 13 years old, so I'm in junior high, and it's a picture of my naturalization, uh, on my naturalization sticker, uh, certificate. So my mom took the U.S. citizenship test at the time, and she passed, and we helped her a lot, quizzing her through all, all the um, questions. And once she passed, she was allowed to change her name, change, and we were allowed my sister and I, as her children, to change our names too. Now, my original birth name is not Patty Kim. It's actually, and I'm going to spell it out for you, and you tell me if if uh, you know how to pronounce it. Okay. R, Y, A, N, G. How would you pronounce that? Ryan. Ranji. Okay, so yeah, that's basically how things went at, at school on the first day. Like the teacher would take a strange little pause before my name, and I knew she was, didn't know how to pronounce it. And, and that always stuck with me. It was like kind of a little bit traumatic for a kid, and then I didn't even know how to correct my teacher. So at some point, I just said, well, just forget the R. I said, just don't pronounce the R. It's just Yang. And it wasn't even Yang, but that was the only way I could figure out to, to, to simplify it for her or him. And so for many years, I was Yang Kim. And the proper pronunciation in Korean is Yang Hee, Kim Yang Hee. But I couldn't teach anybody how to say that, Kim Yang Hee, right? So after all those years of just struggling with my name, I decided I want to change my name. And when my mom and dad said, what do you want to be? I said, I'm identifying as, no, I didn't, I didn't use those terms, but I said, I want to be Patty Kim. Okay, so when I was growing up, my parents brought some albums from Korea, and she was one of those albums, okay? And I would like listen to these records and sing along and look at her picture. And on the back side of this album, there was an even more glamorous picture of her, okay? And stare and think like, oh, she's so like, she's so beautiful, right? I want to, I, I like her. I want to be like her, right? So 
because those images were like there from, from childhood, that so when I was able to like redefine myself, I guess, in, in teenage years, I said, call me Patty Kim. So again, it's really important to have those representation of people that look like you out on the media, on the screen, on magazine covers, in books, in films, so that your identity gets you sort of validated. Um, because if you don't see that at all, you wonder, well, who am I? What am I? What place do I have in my society and in my culture? Okay, so Patty Kim it is. And then this lady popped up on our television screen. Do you guys know who she is? Reporter Connie Chung, yes. Reporter Connie Chung married, I think she was married to Wally Povich, <laughs> right? Um, but she popped up on our living room television screen. And I remember that evening, I stopped, because by then we had never seen an Asian American woman's face on TV. And then my parents stopped and we just stared. And she spoke English impeccably, okay? And I was like, wow, okay? So I said, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should become a, a reporter. Maybe I should get into, uh, you know, that's, gonna, that's what seems to be like really admirable. And um, so I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna study journalism when I went to college at University of Maryland. So I was first a journalism major. And uh, during my first journalism class, the professor asked us to write an essay in the class, Why Journalism? And in the middle of that essay, I talked myself out, journalism. <laughs> and I, I had a little bit of a panic attack because I thought, well, what do I want to do? What do I want to study and be? And um, I spoke to the professor after the class because I was so nervous. Um, uh, because this was something that I had been sort of working toward and wanting, and my parents were really encouraging it. Um, and, I, and, they, and he asked me, well, what do you want to do? Not so much like, you know, I don't want to be on TV or this, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to read more. I felt like I still needed to do much more reading, and I want to write. But I don't want to write um, reports on uh, actual events, because you have to you have to write factually for those events. You can't make it, things up, you know, no matter what you see on headlines today. You really have to keep it factual. And then so that bothered me because there was a part of me that wanted to make things up, okay, and create and be imaginative. Um, so he said, well, it sounds like you would do better in the English department. So uh, that very day, I went to sign up late for any English classes that were still open, and Beginner's Fiction Writing Workshop was open. And that class allowed me the opportunity to write my first short story, and the teacher, and one of his comments, and I still remember that comment, said, I am bowled over by your writing. And that was enough food for me to go on for the rest of my you know, college years. And then I went on to take uh, intermediate writing workshop, advanced writing workshop, and then I went on to um, get my master's in fine arts and creative writing, which produced a novel. And that novel found publication. So this is a book for adults, grown-up book, a cab called Reliable. And New York Times reviewed it, <laughs> uh, which I was quite proud. Oh my, you have a copy of it, wonderful. Uh, and this was, I was young, so I was straight out of master's program. I was in my 20s, um, and uh, I was super duper excited, okay? And I saw my, I saw a writing career um, sort of on the horizon for me. Um, but then I met um, a man at church and uh, I fell in love with him. And not that he had problems, he, he was you know, the, 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 the obstacle to my writing career, because um, I was still writing, I was trying to work on another book, okay? Um, and, but then I got married, and he happened to be, and I didn't know this when I first met him, he happened to live in Riverdale, Maryland. Can you believe that? I couldn't believe that. And he had a house in Riverdale, and it was so like coming home feeling, like, oh, wow, 
So then we got married, we had two kids, and there's a whole stretch of time where I was writing, but nothing was getting published. So my agent at the time even said to me when she read one of my manuscripts, she said, um, what's going on? <laughs> uh, you're, you're, writing is, you know, you're writing an autopilot. That's what she said my writing uh, felt like, autopilot. And then she said, um, and I told her what was going on in my life, and she said, well, literature can wait. Do life for now. Okay, I think that was just her way of telling me I don't want to read your manuscripts anymore. But um, literature can wait, do life now. So that's precisely what I did. I raised the kids, and we did a lot of picture books. We did a lot of you know, children's events at, at Hyattsville Library. I was there. Every Hyattsville event, I was there. And then I decided, okay, it's time for, to write a children's book. So this came out, Here I Am, which is um, no words, just images of a story of a boy who immigrates to New York City from an Asian country, okay? And then after that, I kind of got you know, the writing bug. And this book came out, I'm Ok, a middle grade novel about a boy, also an immigrant, Korean American boy, whose father, dies in the first chapter, I should say. I'm going to spoil it for you. And he is left with his mom to pick up the pieces and try to create a new life without his father. And he's under a lot of stress because uh, he was the main breadwinner of the family, and that income has disappeared with the death of his dad. And he's trying his best to help out, to help his mom survive. And then out of this book, because we meet Mickey McDonald in this book, I get my second um, book of the series, which is It's Girls Like You, Mickey. So I wanted to go ahead and read a little bit out of this, a really short excerpt, and then um, I can take questions, and then if we have time, how are we doing on time? We're good, okay. Uh, if you have questions, then I can, um, Take those, and then we could do a reading for the uh, it's girls like you, Mickey. So this is from chapter seven. We're moving from our two bedroom on 64th to a one bedroom on 68th. The apartment has the same layout, same balcony, is within the same Parkside Gardens complex, but minus a bedroom, minus the view of the creek, and minus $100 on rent. We're higher up, moving from the second floor to the third. I guess you can say we're moving up in the world. It's a shorter walk to the bus stop. The place smells like Clorox. The view is of a parking lot. I can feel the walls closing in on me. My world shrinks. But my mother says, we have to do this. We have to save money. We need money, money, money. It's either this or no electricity or no telephone or no three meals. That $100 prize for winning the talent show would come in handy just about now. She also sold my father's 1972 Mercury Cougar XR7 to the eager deacon co, the church widower, who's crazy about fellowshipping with my mother. He has skin that's cratered like the moon. He has beady eyes. His first wife died in Korea. Cause of death is unknown. His second wife died in America a couple of years ago. Cause of death was cancer. He doesn't have any children. He's got desperate for a wife wallpapered all over him. He's on the hunt for wife number three. He's rich. Depending on whom you're eavesdropping on, he's either a businessman or a life insurance agent. No one knows for sure, and no one bothers to investigate because he gives money to the church and does a lot, like sing in the choir and play the guitar and count the offering money and give rides to old people and fellowship with the widows. I smell a crook. I've noticed him offering my mother coffee. Hey, creep, she doesn't drink coffee. He tries to strike up a conversation about the sermon and the weather. He tries to talk to her about the stages of grief and feeling your feelings and letting go and moving on. I guess he talked her into selling my father's car or she talked him into buying it. She hated that car. 
My father loved that old car. It was the green of the grass that grows in the White House lawn. It had a white vinyl top that matched the white driving cap he wore to hide his thinning hair. I was with him the night he picked it up from Pete's garage, just the two of us taking care of the manly business of buying an antique car. He refused to call it used. It was antique. It was historical. I stood behind my father as he offered the long-haired Pete who had hands as tarred up as his own a wad of cash for a set of keys. He drove it home with the windows down, with me riding next to him on the passenger side. The seat cradled me. I was too low and couldn't see much of what was outside, but I didn't even try to hang out the window or edge myself up for a better view because I wanted to stay close to my dad. His right hand shifted gears, his left hand palmed the steering wheel, his feet pumped the pedals as if in some dance. He was free and in control and driving toward possibilities. He didn't smile, just like Clint would never have smiled, but he looked happy, like things were finally going his way. He, I nestled into the passenger seat, feeling every vibration and jerk and committed my father's new mood to memory. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Why did you pick a, a boy to write about as opposed to a girl? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try to come up with a really good answer, OK? And I think, I think most of this is, is the case. Um, so I'm currently writing a book with a girl as the main protagonist, a Korean girl, Korean-American girl who's a protagonist. And I cannot, I, I'm having a hard time uh, equating her with me, OK? So my story is like almost, it, 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 the material is almost memoir, okay? It, it stays so, it's, it feels like nonfiction more than fiction. So I, I'm guessing that somewhere in my consciousness, like turning it into a boy character, it gives me a healthy separation from my, my, my own being, okay, my own identity. So that's one thing. And also the other thing was, um, I don't, I, it, the origins of this book came from a scene in my own childhood where um, I, I learned, I braided somebody's hair in my middle school. And that scene uh, of, of me braiding hair and uh, gaining some social standing in my gray, in my, among my peers, and I was not a popular person, kid in school. Um, and then wanting to write that scene in, in a book. And then thinking like, okay, well, if I write that scene, that's me. It's so much more like interesting because a boy, like just, I know I'm going with stereotypes here, but a boy braiding hair, think about that. And then I wonder, well, why is he braiding, you know, hair? Why is he telling everybody? Why? And then, oh, he's making money, okay. Oh, why is he needing to make money? Oh, something's going on in his family where, and so I, I, it gives me a chance to like be more like imaginative and creative and go beyond like the actual events of my own life. So I think that's why I made, I went with a boy character. Thank you. It means it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Elisa. I'm I live in New Pendleton, but I uh, I teach in my I work in Riverdale, Maryland. So I feel very connected. Um, I'm Korean as well. My question is, how did you come up with the title? I I'm ok. Uh -huh. I'm ok. It's also I'm okay. Ok. Yes. So yes. It was, I was under pressure because I, I had submitted the manuscript. The manuscript was accepted, 
and the editor said, well, we need a title because it was still untitled. And I, I was under pressure that I needed to come up with a title. And, find, and I said, well, his name is Ok. And there was an excerpt in the book where a teacher explains to him, like, oh, your name is so interesting because th there's also, it can be also be OK. And then she goes into being, oh, you're OK. You know, and he, he likes that. And then so I thought, OK, let's do I'm Ok, right? And then I like, I like that you have to figure out how to pronounce his name, right? Uh, and then Ok, like Ok. The, the sound, ok. So, yeah. Anyone else? Yes. I'll say, I'll say, you know, no thank you. <laughs> if it's too personal. But go ahead, ask. Uh, peer pressure. Um, peer pressure, as in like me wanting the, the, the pressure to do something that I don't want to do, that kind of stuff. Um, to be something that I don't, I, I, I wish not to be. Oh, just to, oh yes, yes, all of it, just to fit in. I think that the day that my parents told my four-year-old mind that I was going to America. Something clicked where, oh, I need to be something else now. You know, must have. Whatever I've heard, you know, unconsciously, it must have seeped into me that, oh, I have to be this thing that's American now. And it stayed with me throughout the years, right? And it, it, it went to me changing my name. Although it was a Korean woman, she changed hers from her Korean name to an American name. Um, and uh, also, and so when I was in high, when I was in junior high and high school, I was in um, a, camp, a school that was predominantly Jewish. So, and there were maybe a handful of Asian kids, a handful of African American kids. Um, I wanted to be Jewish for a really long time. Um, <laughs> I'm making you laugh, David. And I went to my share of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs enough to know this Jewish thing is pretty awesome, you know. And so, yeah, fitting in, wanting to be like the majority, right? Not wanting to be, I guess the word is marginalized or being minority. Um, but I think that comes with just growing up and being that age. And then at some point in your adulthood, you have to like just say, you know, I am who I am, right? Um, and accept it and embrace it and love it and take advantage of it, right? And I think I, that happened probably in college, you know. Um, hopefully it'll happen sooner for you. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Um, did you ever go back to baby school? I did, but not young. So my sister got married. And then that year, my parents and I went to Korea, and I was in graduate school. Um, and I have to say that the moment I got off the plane, my aunt, who's very stylish, very fashionable, very beautiful, got off the plane. First thing she did was she put her fingernail on my eyes. <laughs> and she said, oh, we can get you sanka fur. <laughs> Like she, she wanted like to get uh, my eyes fixed. Um, uh, you know, I know where we can go, right? Uh, I didn't, but uh, that was like my experience of like my first moment stepping back into Korea. And then I also remember driving uh, that that night. The whole hillsides of Korea, Korea were covered in red neon crosses. So there were a lot of churches. A lot of uh, the missionaries did good in Korea. So they were like just everybody was you know. And so I remember those are the two distinct memories, but it was great to reconnect with my aunt, my uncle, my cousins, um, and I definitely did not feel like I, I belonged there anymore. It was a place to visit. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, if none of them have questions, I have yes. questions for you. I'm Ella. I also Hi, work at the Ella. library. Thank you so much for being with us today. Sure. All right, my first question. What is your favorite part of writing? Uh, having written. 
<laughs> so that is the highlight, is, is having written and then uh, sharing it with the world. Um, the process of actually making the book is quite uh, lonely. Um, and it's like hanging out with imaginary friends. It, it, there's so much you can do with imaginary friends, right? Um, so there's that, and then after having written, I can come out and share the book and talk about it, and then also experience the response of it, which is incredibly um, gratifying. So that's my favorite part about writing. I think that makes sense. <laughs> Um, do you have any advice for uh, aspiring young writers? Um, anybody interested in writing? Writing, you are. At this stage, I say pay attention. Okay, pay attention to the to your life, to you, yourself, and to the people around you, and make observations uh, of your world. Okay, those are the best skills to have at this stage and to develop. And if you feel like it jot down a few words, okay? And it doesn't have to be uh, anything like extraordinary. Like it doesn't have to be some huge event to earn your words, okay? It can be something as ordinary as, um, okay, there's a, that's making me think about a poem. I wanna try to recite it. I might get it wrong. Mary Oliver has a poem called Prayer or Praying. Do, we, do you know? Oh, I'm not. Okay, she says, um, the poem says, um, it, it does not have to be a blue iris. It can be a weed in a vacant lot. It can be a few small stones. Um, just pay attention, then patch a few words together. They don't have to be elaborate. This is not a contest. It is a doorway into thanks and a silence so that another may speak. So that would be my advice to you. It doesn't have to be a blue iris. It can be a weed in a vacant lot. Just patch a few words together and pay attention, right? Yeah, and that's, that's easy to do because that's just part of living, right? Now I used to advise people, young people, to write every day, read every day, you know, journal, keep a journal, because that's what I did. I, I was a religious journal keeper. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know if that's like, like the best advice at, at this stage, mm -hmm. right? Because you can like easily get tired of that, right? So. For sure. Such good advice. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So why do you write about hard subjects like death or poverty in books that are meant for young readers? Um, okay, so think about a playground. Okay, um, a physical playground. So, and you have people, kids climbing and doing things right. And when they're on that playground, there's just a, a, a enough element of risk, right, to make it fun, right? Um, climbing high or this, yeah. so I think of like books as a playground for the mind or a playground for emotion for kids. Okay, so you're not out there exercising your physical muscles, but but in a book you're exercising uh, psychological muscles or emotional muscles so that you are vicariously experiencing through ulk, a death of a parent, um, po po poverty, stress, uh, and that kind of exercise in your, in your head makes you stronger, makes you more resilient, uh, makes you more empathetic, okay? So it's a, caref it's a safe way to um, experience uh, tragedy. And then it prepares you for your own. Because you know what, it's inevitable, <laughs> okay? So then it makes you a stronger human being, so. Absolutely, and I think you've done a great job with balancing these hard topics with books that are really meant for this age group, so. And I try to, I, and I also wanna balance it with laughter. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the two stand, gold and silver standards of fiction is uh, tears is the, is the gold standard, and, so, uh, and, t and laughter is the silver standard. You know, so if I can achieve those two, uh, I, 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 I did good. <laughs> Let's see, um, we've already talked about where you get your inspiration for your characters in a question earlier. Um, I know that you said that your book coming out is from a girl's perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you 
How has that writing style been different? How has that it, process been, been different? It's been incredibly difficult uh, because it's, it feels like me a lot. I, I resist so much to what exactly happened, what exactly happened. And then most of my school visits, I, I introduce myself with my own like immigration story. So there is an instinct in me to share that, you know, and, and all the stuff that we, we went through. Um, but there's also resistance because like, my parents are still alive. <laughs> my sisters, you know. No, and so so I don't. So that's a. I, I'm struggling with this book, um, and I'm trying to like twist it and turn it, and you know. But there's parts of it that feel really inauthentic, and so yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Yeah. That's a different. It was a difficult question, so I appreciate that you answered it. Thank you. Um, hopefully, this is an easy one to follow. Uh, what is your favorite childhood book? Or books. Okay, the one that I remember the most is Ramona. Oh, okay. So Ramona, the Pest, is a book. I think it was the, like the first book I finished reading. That's why from cover to cover. But also, I wasn't a very good reader uh, when I was growing up. Um, but she stuck with me because um, there was a scene in that book where she forgets to um, plug in the crock pot or turn on the crock pot for the family dinner, and they all get home after a long day and. There's raw meat in the crock pot, and she's she's the one to blame because she was supposed to turn that on, and that was me with the rice cooker. <laughs> like if I didn't put that rice cooker on, you know, at, before we left for school, it was like we had like gross rice. <laughs> so I I just remember thinking, oh wow, she she went through it too, and she wasn't Korean American, and so we, I wasn't in any way relating to her as a fellow Korean American immigrant girl. It was just a girl, you know, who, who, who was in a working class family, and she had to do her chores and obligations, and she, you know, missed it. And I think that's what makes Ramona so relatable, is that there's, it's really honest childhood writing. Yeah. Like, that is just all of us. Yeah. Um, in one of the other books, I remember, um, she's trying to tell time and her mother says to leave a quarter after. Uh -huh. So she leaves 25 minutes instead of 15 minutes. Uh -huh. um, and that was, you know, that's all of us before we know <laughs> so, how to tell time. So now we're gonna talk about Ramona's scenes. So when she uh, waits for the present, remember that? Yeah. So that her kindergarten teacher tells her, wait here, you know, <laughs> for the present, right? Because she doesn't call roll, right? And I remember reading that and thinking, Right, and thinking like, oh, I remember having done something like that. So in kindergarten, I, I didn't know English very well, uh, and I remember like being on high alert because the teacher was calling roll, and then everybody was saying something after she called roll, but it wasn't here. Everybody was saying something different, and I kept thinking like, what is? Why are all these words different? And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to find the link or the pattern to these words so that I can say a correct word. And then I thought, are these food words? Are these words that all start with a letter? But I couldn't find a pattern. And then I thought, OK, I'm just going to say cake, because I like cake. You know, and she calls on me, right? So she you know, butchers my name, calls on me. And I say cake, and she moves on to the next uh, kid. I'm like, yes, I did it. I did it. And, and that was, you know, welcome to America. I'm here. <laughs> Did you say cake every time or just one? <laughs> no, because after that, it was like, here, here. Everybody said here. But that first day, everybody was saying something different, and it threw me off. But that reminded me of Ramona and her messing up roll call. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Sure. So I know that you said that your favorite part of writing is being done. Mm -hmm. um, how, and I know you said that you were you know, working on the, the book still. How long generally does it take for you to write something? Uh, different, different. This one was done in like a weekend. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, and then uh, the story was written in a weekend. This one, uh, some years, because it, it, it morphed into different, um, uh, it was first in verse, and then uh, the editor said, I really think you have more to say, so we turned it, I turned it into prose. This one uh, was on deadline, so I managed to write it in like a year, year and a half. But this one took maybe like a good five, four or five years. Oh, okay. yeah. so like a big difference between yeah. them. Awesome. What do you like to do when you're not writing? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I actually like to just stare out my window. Ooh. 
<laughs> I have a really good view from my window upstairs in my office, and I can see um, all the uh, people walking by with their dogs and their strollers. And uh, I have I, I have a nice street, so I get, and it it's just so nice to just observe and pay attention. And um, I don't I know some of them. I don't know some of them. And I, I you listen eavesdrop sometimes if they're talking to somebody. Um, so yeah, i have probably just staring out the window has, has been my pastime lately. Honestly, that and sounds I, wonderful. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very relaxing, you know. So there's nothing wrong with that. I think it comes with age too. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you hear from your readers much? And if so, what kinds of things do they say? I hear from my readers when I do my uh, school visits. Um, I don't. I do sometimes get fan mail, um, and they say, you know, really lovely things. Um, I haven't gotten any hate mail. Oh, so. okay, good. <laughs> and it's usually like, uh, you know, this is, I I really like this character, and you know, yeah. And do, are, you, are you related to BTS? <laughs> <laughs> so just the important stuff. <laughs> So I know that you gave us a whole story about what you wanted to be when you grew up until you got to college. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else that you were considering besides journalism, or was it just a straight shot to journalism and then? Yeah, off I the was English? pretty. I was pretty committed to becoming like a news reporter. Um, uh, I'm thinking early, early on, maybe I wanted to be a hairdresser. Okay. Um, so, and I, a dancer at some point. I feel like we all want to be dancers at some I know, point, right? and then we're just not. Um, what was your reaction when you first heard your book was going to be published? I know you said that you were young. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? The first book. The first book. Oh my goodness, I remember because I was teaching, uh, I was TAing at, at University of Maryland um, for English class, and it was right before. Um, I don't know because we didn't have cell phones. And I'm wondering how in the world, I must have gotten some message that I was supposed to call my agent. And so I was in the um, Tolliver building, mm. one of those UMD buildings, and waiting to teach class. And I used the payphone to call, and she gave me the news. And I was, I was like so excited. And then I went to class and I told my, my English 101 class. I'm getting a book published. And they're like, hey. <laughs> so, yeah. I can't imagine how thrilling that was. It was so <laughs> thrilling. It was so thrilling. Yeah. What does your family think of your writing? Um, I think at this stage, they're really proud of me. Okay. Yeah. At this stage, <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> they were quite disappointed oh, that no. I moved. I I changed my major. Like really? my dad was really disappointed that he, he really wanted me to be on TV, you know, reciting the reading the news. Um, and then after my first book got published, I called him. They were in Korea at the time, my parents, and I called him, I said, I got a book deal for my book and he, he was like, Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good, right? And then um, so yeah, so it was like it, it have you know, they, they came around to it. That's so, understandable. Yeah. I would hope they've come around since yeah. since then. They come around. But you know what's interesting? Like yeah. my dad, I just learned, is like a writer. Like he, he actually like, um, he was writing all these essays uh, in Korean at his church newsletter. Oh. And they were getting published um, at his like church magazine. It was the um, Seventh-day Adventist magazine. So, so he asked me to type up all his um, essays that he had published, right? This had just happened recently. And he, he gave me all the manuscripts, and he had some, he must have Google translated all his um, excerpts, because they were all like, kind of like, kind of like <laughs> that, <Not> really. <laughs> <laughs> so it, and they, were, and they were taped. Like they were excerpts that he must have printed, cut out, and taped, right? So they were all taped on a piece of paper. He said, can you just like do me a straight, you know? And that's why I gave, I typed it all out for him, right? So he, he is a writer. You know, and, and, and then he, and then I read some of the stuff that he remembered from when we first immigrated, because some of that stuff was in there. Um, so I was like, oh, so maybe I get it from him. Do you yeah. feel like you have similar writing styles as far as what you're interested in writing about? He, he's more like didactic. He, 
he's much more, and it might be because he has a church um, audience, but he's much more about preaching. You know, so if there's a story he's going to tell, it's got to all like kind of come down to a moral like message in the end. And I'm so not about that. <laughs> you know, I'm so about let's just explore the person, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to teach you anything. I just want you to get to know <laughs> this person as a human being, and whatever that does to you is whatever lesson you walk away from. But, and I learned that the sort of the anti-didactic method from um, my professor, Jack Salamanca in University of Maryland, it was advanced fiction. And I must have been, like some of my stories must have been kind of tying together too nicely. <laughs> and, and he sort of like opened my eyes to like sort of the art side of writing, not so much the propaganda side of writing, <laughs> you know? So, um, and, and, and that kind of opened up an entire new kind of way of like, you know, seeing people and relating. And so it, it was quite an education um, for me. Um, sounds messy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So I know that you spoke a little bit about the general memories and experiences that made it into your books. Um, are there any specific moments in your books besides the braiding that you can think of that are really reflective of your childhood or a moment in your childhood? Um, there, there is a lot. Um, there, there is a lot. There's like, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot. And I, I, I have this way of just taking a kernel of uh, my own memory and uh, morphing it. And so I always call this exercise a mingling of memory and imagination. So that little bit that I remember um, and feels dear to me is the emotional portway or portal into um, like feeling something for the character. And then from there, once I'm emotionally anchored, then I can start making stuff up. Um, so that's my process. Uh, because if, it's, if I'm not feeling like connected in any way, it's really hard to like write this character in a believable way. Um, so, does that answer? Yeah, it does. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we have time for like one more question. Um, I think my question is going to be, so you started off with an adult novel, yes. but then you've moved to children's novels. Yes. Um, what was that switch like? The writing? It was really easy. Really? It was so liberating. Too. Really? Yes, it really was. Um, because the, my first novel is actually a, a child character, right? And it's told from uh, adult boys. Mm -hmm. So there was, I, I think I'm still kind of stuck there, you know, like emotionally. And I, got, I, I guess I, so, um, so, um, so it was a very easy switch. It was very aggression. It, it like was like kind of liberating, you know? And middle grade is especially fun to do because they still hold on to that little bit of like, innocence, you know, uh, and then, the, but they're also like busting at the seams with attitude <laughs> and knowledge and, you know, and experience and, and language, um, which is a great, great uh, arena to play in. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, did anyone else have any other questions that they thought of? I'm curious. <laughs> like, do you write a children's book? Do you, while you're writing, do you read to them? Yeah, so Oka, Oka's actually, like, I would read chapter by chapter. After I finish a chapter, I'd say, okay, guys, come on, i got to read you the next chapter. And I remember one scene in the book where, uh, where Oka's um, teach, learning how to roller skate from Mickey in the pool. Uh, I was reading that scene, and my youngest one, which was at, who was at the time maybe like seven, uh, eight or maybe eight years old, she was an elementary, she said seven or eight years old. She was just like this. She was like, the, and then after the end of the uh, chapter, she goes, mommy, can I be in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> like she wanted, she wanted to be cast in the movie, right? <laughs> so I, then I knew her reaction was like, oh, that felt real to her. Like that scene came alive to her, right? So they were like my captive, like 
you know, uh, what do you call it, reading group, what, what, you know, immediate risk focus group, right? Um, so that was great. And then, um, but once I started writing Mickey, they were like, done. They were like, okay, I gotta <laughs> listen to it again. <laughs> the first but, one's like a novelty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and my husband is, like, he's thrilled for me, so. Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Any questions? Do it. Yeah. You can ask whatever you want within reason. Uh, I like to write about um, kids who are um, facing challenging uh, events in their lives. Yeah. That's a good question. Hi, Sian. Oh, um, okay, so it's different for children's book and my my uh, my adult book. So my prof one of my professors actually gave me a list of agents. Um, maybe it was five agents to send a, a query to with uh, the first um, couple of chapters, and my. Uh, my book ended up in the slush pile of the, of the agent who picked it up. And so she had an intern going through her slush pile and then they pulled it out. And so that's how I found my first agent. My kid agent was from my first agent. She recommended her. So she connected me to an agent that she knew. Um, but I think they're, they're probably, now it's probably a different process because it used to be go to the literary marketplace to find an agent and they have specifics about what they're looking for and what they want to um, take on. But I, I don't know what now what. I believe they still publish that Okay. with just a book just full of. But now I feel like Twitter is like the place to be mm. for finding an agent. They have what, like the, um, the, the, the pitch wars? Yeah. Yeah, they and I, a I know a, a, a writer who got an agent through the pitch wars on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I think even uh, the, the, the writer of um, uh, The Hate You Give, oh. she got her agent through Pitch War on Twitter. She, I think she put out something like, anybody interested in you know, the YA novel about um, Black Lives Matter? That was, that's yeah. all it took. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely agree with you. Yeah. So I think it's a completely different game now than it's when like I was looking West. for an agent, yeah. And somebody, I was in the parking lot coming in and uh, someone, a mom stopped me and said, um, like, do you need to get an English degree also to oh. become a writer? She was question. asking for her daughter. Um, and uh, I said, no, you don't. Some people might, it might help. For me, I had to, you know, but some people, it's like, you just have to have a manuscript. Um, yeah, you just have to write. Oh, um, I, you can go on my website and contact me through there. We highly recommend. <laughs> yeah, I was just at Sandy Spring uh, last week, and then I met some DC schools next week. Mm, yes, I was uh, a couple months ago, I was at a DC school too. So Penn Faulkner is the um, coordinator who uh, t sends me to DC schools to do um, visits, yeah. Those are great visits. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, I think that might be it. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking thank with us Thank you today. so much for being here, everybody. And thank you, everyone, for coming.